Hi, Mary here at Mary's Heirloom Seeds. And our last video, we talked about planning your square foot garden or your garden in general with companion planting in mind. What I didn't do is go into a lot of detail about specific companions, and I wanted to do that today. So what I talked about in our last video, which I'll share down below in the description section, what I shared in our last video was our main crops, like tomatoes, peppers, squash, uh, and then some of the additions that we added, like Swiss chard, and those are what I would consider your main crop in your garden. But what I didn't mention, like I said, was specific companions. There are a lot of different herbs, flowers, that you can use to benefit other crops in your garden. And that's what companion planting comes in. Companion planting is simply uh, planting companions, uh, varieties that grow well together and that might benefit the other crop. So I have a list here. The list is pretty awesome. So I had to get everything written down so I didn't forget anything. Uh, dill is the first one I would like to share with you. We carry a few different varieties of dill on our website at marysheirloomseeds.com. Uh, dill benefits the cabbage family, also corn, cucumbers, and even the onion family. Uh, I avoid planting dill around carrots and tomatoes. Uh, dill can be planted around flowers. It is pretty hardy and doesn't need a lot of nutrients or a lot of attention. Uh, it's pretty pest uh, tolerant, so that's a really good one. If you like to grow cucumbers to make your own pickles, growing your own dill would be an excellent addition to that. Or if you like dilly beans, I know Josh at the city said, mentioned that he loves dilly beans. So we're definitely gonna plant a lot more dill this year. Now, what a lot of people don't realize is dill can attract the tomato hornworm. So that's one of the reasons I don't plant it around, uh, around my tomatoes. See behind me here, we've got a couple companions and we'll get to those next. Uh, tomato hornworms aren't as evil as some people make them out to be. Uh, some people like to keep the tomato hornworm in their garden because it turns into a sphinx moth. Now a sphinx moth is a beneficial pollinator. So while a tomato hornworm, which is pretty obvious, uh, it has a orange horn on it, uh, it turns into the sphinx moth and a sphinx moth is a nocturnal pollinator. So I wouldn't necessarily rule out dill in your garden just because of the uh, hornworm factor. And I don't always, um, I don't always remove hornworms. Sometimes we just place them in another area in our garden. So the dill gets its own little spot outside and away from my tomatoes. Basil, probably the most common companion plant we use. We put basil in all of our beds, as well as borage, which is right behind me, and we'll get to that as well. Uh, dill is, I'm sorry, already talked about dill. Uh, basil is great for tomatoes, for peppers, for squash. You can pretty much plant it anywhere. Um, it does attract beneficial insects um, like the hoverfly, uh, ladybugs, and bees. You can let basil go to seed or bolt, um, and that is when it starts to create or grow flowers, usually we would pinch those off if we want just the leaves. But if you wanna save the seeds, Obviously, you're going to let it bolt because that's where you're going to get the seeds from. But it will also attract beneficial pollinators to your garden. And that is really important. Uh, lemon bee balm. Uh, not everybody plants lemon bee balm in their garden, uh, but lemony varieties tend to repel insects. So lemon bee balm is a great one. It also can attract hummingbirds, uh, but it is a perennial herb. And I did mention in our last video that I prefer to plant perennial herbs in containers. If you see along here, this is our greenhouse. Uh, these are bucket gardens, part of our bucket garden. And I would normally plant perennial herbs in a bucket uh, or a container because I don't necessarily want it to take over my garden. And lemon bee balm can definitely take over your garden. Uh, now the next one is lemon balm. 
not to be con uh, confused with lemon bee balm. Uh, lemon balm is great to grow by cabbage uh, or squash plants even because it can deter pests. Again with the lemon. Lemon is a, a strong scent and the pests don't really like it that much. It's a good thing, right? Uh, it's an also a perennial herb um, and it attracts pollinators and again the citrusy scent or odor uh, can deter pests that way. It can deter gnats and mosquitoes which is awesome in my book because mosquitoes find me there could be one mosquito in the whole town and it'll find me and get me so uh, lemon bee balm is definitely an excellent option to add to your garden uh, and there aren't very many as far as I know there's nothing that you can't plant around lemon bee balm I'm sorry lemon balm so something to add to your garden if you haven't already added lemon balm to your garden it's a good one and some of these are beneficial herbs that you can consume as well so that's an extra bonus basil if you haven't seen my video I'll post the link in the comments I did a video on how to make your own basil lemonade and it was this beautiful shade of pink uh, and that's because I use purple opal basil so there are so many different options for pollinators and for companion plants in your garden. Catnip. Now, if you're like me and you have cats, uh, you might grow your own catnip. I did a video uh, with Lucy, our cat. She's our tiny cat. And the drawback of planting catnip in your garden is it might attract cats. Uh, the benefit to possibly attracting cats is if you have gophers, like me, uh, the cats can actually hunt the gophers. So it's, it, it's a catch-22, you know, you, it, it might work to attract the cats, it might deter the pests, but having cats in your garden isn't always the best thing either, right? Uh, I don't know about you, but I have one bed where I've had a cat kind of dig up a little bit. So I'm not really happy with uh, the neighbor's cat in that aspect. Uh, we do have a big property here, but it would be nice if she would stay out of my garden. I'm going to fix this really quick. There we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, moving on with catnip, it is a member of the mint family. And if you've ever grown mint, you know that it can spread. So some people will plant mint varieties in a container and then bury it in your garden. Now that works to keep it from spreading unless it goes to seed. So all of these different things to take into consideration when you are using companion planting in your garden. Uh, now catnip is a companion plant for quite a few. Uh, its oil properties repel a lot of different insects and pests. Um, and it also can be added to your soil uh, to help boost your soil as well. Um, it's a great way to repel pests organically by using things like catnip. Uh, insects that are it deters would be um, ants, aphids, cabbage loopers, uh, the potato beetle. So if you're growing potatoes, we did a video on chitting your potatoes and we've got another one coming up about growing your potatoes. Uh, catnip is a great one for the, cute, the potato beetle. Also Japanese beetles, flea beetles, cockroaches, weevils, and even the squash bug. Hate squash bugs. So definitely catnip is a huge benefit in your garden if you want to deter pests naturally. Um, like I mentioned though, it can be invasive. So you might want to plant it in a container or plant in a container and bury it in your garden so that you don't have it spreading all over the place. Uh, chamomile, German chamomile. If you've ever had a nice warm cup of chamomile tea, it is so soothing. So you can plant it in your garden to not only deter pests, but then you can harvest your own herbs and use it uh, for your own health benefits as well. Uh, it is an annual, not a perennial, so you'll have to plant it each year, but it can go to seed. So if you allow the flowers to produce seeds and then let them drop in your garden, it will naturally reseed itself. You won't have to buy them all over again next year. And it is a fantastic one because it hosts hoverflies and wasps. Now, 
back onto the tomato hornworm, if you attract wasps to your garden, they can lay their eggs, uh, the parasitic wasp lays the eggs on the hornworm and uses it as a host. So wasps are actually beneficial in your garden. You might not like if they make a nest by your house, but wasps are definitely a beneficial in your garden. So we definitely don't want to spray them. Uh, they also accumulate calcium, potassium, and sulfur, which you can later return to the soil. So we don't dig up plants once they're no longer viable in your garden, once they stop producing. Uh, we typically either uh, allow them to go to seed and collect the seeds, or we take the, um, like some of these here, you'll see I'm allowing the borage to go to seed. That's what's here. Um, I'll get to borage too, but it can improve your soil. So a lot of these that we allow to get overgrown and before we're ready to plant again, we just allow it to go crazy and then we'll pull it up and use it in our compost pile to uh, give some more boost to your soil. So awesome benefits here. Lavender is another one. You can't see the lavender because it's on the other side of the borage, uh, but lavender is also a perennial in cooler states. So it may not last as long in Florida where it gets very hot all the time. Uh, but here, uh, I've got a lavender here that's been growing for several years and it's, it's, it is big, but it kind of gets dwarfed by this giant plant here. Uh, it repels fleas and moths, which is awesome. Uh, we can also use the lavender in a tea, so it's beneficial as well to us. Uh, and it also um, can deter moths inside your home. So you can use the dried sprigs, uh, just keep it away from your pets, uh, and you might put it in a closet or in a cabinet, and it might deter some moths on the inside of your house, which is a plus. Uh, but it doesn't like to stay wet. So when you are growing lavender, um, whether it's as a companion plant or in a container, you do want to allow it to have a slightly more drier soil because it doesn't like to stay wet. Marigolds. Probably the most popular uh, companion plant we use in our garden. Uh, there are two types of marigolds. One is African and one is French. Uh, but there's a third that we talk about that is a pot marigold and that's calendula. I've got calendula in a handful of beds on the other side. And now while I'm, I'm reading a lot about calendula and it's technically not part of the marigold, it's not a French or an African marigold, it still has beneficial properties similar to a marigold in your garden. And it's beautiful. We use uh, calendula in our hand salve. Uh, my hands get really, really uh, dried out and rough during the gardening season, um, which around here can be year round. Uh, so we use our own calendula infused oil. I'll also link the video on how to make your own calendula oil down below in the uh, description section. But let's get back to French and African marigolds. Uh, the French marigold is the smaller, the shorter of the two varieties of marigolds. And it's probably the most recognizable. A lot of people uh, notice the French marigold. It's a lot shorter. Uh, I love the shorter varieties because it doesn't take up as much space in our raised beds. Uh, and I use the African variety around the garden so that I don't have to overcrowd my other crops inside the raised beds, right? Uh, now the African marigold grows much larger uh, and so that's what I was mentioning. I do put it in areas where it's not going to overcrowd. Now, really important stuff about marigolds, okay? They are an annual. Uh, the African variety can withstand a lot more of a drier conditions or drought tolerant, which is why it's really beneficial for us here. Now, once established, the marigold can secrete a chemical that deters or gets rid of nematodes. Now there are good nematodes and there are bad nematodes and we're talking about the bad nematodes. Uh, let's see, once established, uh, nematodes are very difficult to eradicate. So if you've seen root knot nematodes, if you've pulled up a tomato plant and it's all knotty and it's really not a healthy plant, you might have a nematode problem. 
So planting marigolds everywhere you have tomatoes can be really, really helpful. But if you already have a nematode problem, you can also uh, till in or dig under actual marigold plants because again, the substance within the marigold can deter or eradicate uh, nematodes. There's no absolutely it's going to work, but it's definitely worth a shot. If you've ever had nematodes taking over your garden and you see uh, your tomatoes get not so healthy, I'm looking over at my tomato I'm about to pull out and plant some more stuff in there. Uh, definitely add marigolds to your garden. They are not only beautiful, but beneficial. Uh, marigolds also deter beetles, including the bean beetle, the asparagus beetle, uh, the leaf hopper, white flies, tomato moss, uh, cabbage white fly, white fly, and uh, cab sorry, cabbage moth <laughs> and white fly, <laughs> um, as well as sweet corn moths. So it's not just beneficial for your tomatoes. You definitely want to plant it around your garden. Marigolds are amazing. And last but certainly not least is our borage. Um, I'm going to try and pull this up here. Borage is beneficial for your soil as well as your uh, garden when it's growing. So you have these pretty little blooms. Uh, I pulled this out, it's gonna turn blue. Uh, borage is a great companion uh, for your tomatoes. It does deter tomato hornworm, so that's a big plus in my book. Uh, but not just tomatoes. Uh, it also is good around your cabbage and around your strawberries. I read that it actually can help improve the taste of your strawberries, so that's pretty awesome. So if you're growing strawberries, you definitely want to consider adding borage to your garden. Uh, but there's another uh, benefit to it, and that is in your soil. I have another video about making your own fertilizer out of borage leaves. It's amazing. Um, borage leaves are known to contain potassium, calcium, and vitamin C. So your garden definitely needs vitamins or minerals just like our bodies do. So why not add some to your garden? Uh, it is also a beneficial pollinator attracting plant. So if you are in an area where you don't get a lot of pollinators, I might have to move. I'm getting a little bit of sun. I love when the sun comes out, right? It's early morning here. I don't always get to film early in the morning, but today I am. Uh, so definitely add borage if you want to improve the quality of your soil. Uh, we allow this to grow and then we allow it to dry and we will pull it up and oftentimes we put it in our compost pile or we'll just dig it into a bed and allow it to age and decompose in a bed. So, now that you've seen our companion planting video, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, we've got so many different beneficial videos on our YouTube channel, and I really hope you've enjoyed this one. I will have even more later on. Someone asked about trap crops, so I'll definitely share one about trap crops. Um, I've got another one coming up about peas. We love growing peas, and they're pretty awesome. Uh, so, if you have any questions, I'm Mary at Mary's Heirloom Seeds and you're welcome to send an email or comment on this video. My email is mary at marysheirloomseeds.com. Uh, check us out on our website, which is marysheirloomseeds.com. And if you haven't already, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram and all that fun social media stuff. And uh, if it's plenty warm where you are or maybe it's cold and you want to plant indoors, go ahead and plant some seeds. Uh, I'm Mary signing off and happy planting.